Good morning. Good morning. Good to see you. Um, how are you? You're, you're going to be talking a little bit about um, portfolios and, and how they should prioritize natural resource equities. Is that right? Correct. Great. Correct. Well, I'll, so, I'll hand uh, over to you uh, for your presentation and we'll, we'll, okay. we'll have some questions for you just after. Good morning, everybody. Um, uh, my name is Nolo Halloran and I'm the Chief Investment Officer at KBI Global Investors uh, based in Dublin. Uh, as you can see, I'm from my home office uh, this morning. Um, in terms of who KBI are, uh, KBI are a specialist boutique equity manager. Uh, we're part of the Amundi Group, who are our majority owner since 2016. Uh, as of this morning, we manage about $12 billion in uh, specialist long only equities. Um, we have our, our home office in Dublin, uh, a team of about 62 people, and we also have an office in Boston. Uh, and as you can see from the slide, uh, we have a very global client base uh, spread from Asia to Europe to, to the Americas. Uh, and importantly, and something I'll touch on today, from uh, a responsible investing perspective, we have a very long history uh, and lots of accreditations when it comes to uh, responsible investing. So. What I was going to talk about today is, is natural resource investing. Um, but from my perspective, uh, to bring uh, natural resources with a difference. So when people historically think of natural resources, they speak of oil or natural gas or coal or sand or metals or mining. Uh, and that's where many investors today are invested and have been invested. Uh, for us at KBI, it's much, much more about uh, looking at the future needs and the three key natural resources of the future from our perspective, which is water, uh, clean energy and food. Uh, and this is a journey we started on back in 2000. Um, and clearly all are sustainable, uh, which is a difference. Um, so uh, what drives that? I think this slide really shows, uh, I suppose, the journey where it started from our point of view. So I think Chris talked about uh, mega trends. So for us, this is a mega, uh, mega trend that it will bring multi multiple decades source of alpha for investors. Uh, there are, from our perspective, what we call five indisputables driving uh, the alpha opportunity when it comes to these three key natural resources. And those five indisputables are, you can see the, the kind of macro drivers, what's common to water, to clean energy, and to food is that all three have insufficient supply, they have increased demand and increasing regulation. Um, so they are sort of, if, if you like, the problems out there. In terms of the solutions, and this is what I'll talk a little bit about today, uh, the solutions will be very much driven by increased infrastructure spending and increased spend on technological solutions. Uh, and that leads us to what you can see at the bottom of the page uh, to put some color on it. If we talk about agribusiness, if we talk about water, or if we talk about clean energy, you can break that down into sort of nine segments, some of which become much more uh, apparent to people over recent years, such as in the, in the renewable energy space. We're now very familiar with wind and solar. Uh, 10 or 15 years ago, that wasn't the case. But also within the water industry, there's lots going on the technology side. Again, it may not be as sexy as some of the topics get, that get discussed these days, but it is, it is, believe me, very sexy when it comes to the water industry, which is an absolute need for, for each of us on our daily basis. So that's the sort of setting the scene in terms of the long-term alpha opportunity. If I just uh, run a parallel journey then, uh, this is the World Economic Forum at Davos. Each year they survey the participants uh, as to what they see as the five top five key global risks. Uh, what's interesting here is I show this slide from 2011 to 2020. What's great is that in the deep blue, uh, you can see as of the last four years, four of the top five current risks as seen are all related to either water or energy or climate change in general. Uh, if I showed you the previous decade, I believe there was no dark blue. So uh, global leaders up to 2010, if you like, were in denial. What's important from our perspective is that today, our journey and, and the sort of global journey have merged. Uh, and therefore, society in general today understands that there are major uh, issues out there. Um, companies understand it. 
uh, governments understand it. And why is that important? I suppose it's important because when governments and companies get it, they are finally spending money on it, uh, which helps the companies that we invest in. And I think the other point I'd make just for the forum today is that investors are also getting it. So over the last five years in particular, we have seen a major acceleration in interest in these strategies, uh, particularly from you know, retail investors, foundations and endowments, uh, pension plans and sovereign wealth fa funds. So it, it's, it's really uh, paralleled, I suppose, with the sort of World Economic Forum findings. And to put that into, uh, into some context, I call this the yet slide. Um, and you can see when we talk about water, uh, only 1% of the water on the planet is available for use, yet water demand is going to grow by 40% by 2030. When it comes to the clean energy space, uh, fossil fuels has become public enemy number one. It's become climate change uh, enemy number one. Uh, we have a problem there, yet energy demand is forecast to grow by 50% by 2050. And then finally, just when it comes to land, we all know, uh, as with water, that land is a finite uh, you know, asset out there, it's, it's scarce, it's not going to grow, uh, yet uh, food demand is going to grow by 65% by 2050, not least with a growing um, global population. So to bring that together in the core of this slide, um, I talked earlier on about solutions. Uh, so here we can see in, in infrastructure investment alone, a forecast for water, power and agri, uh, you can see the figures for yourself. There, so there is massive spend, roughly 40 to 50% of total global infrastructure spend is actually uh, going to be uh, spent on water. In this case, power includes, uh, it's roughly 70 to 80% clean energy and 20% in traditional energy uh, and agribusiness. So this is, when I talk about mega trends and tailwinds, that's why we're so excited about talking to you today about natural resources uh, with a difference. So there is a problem, clearly, insufficient supply, rising demand. And the next slide really shows you, I suppose, from a portfolio perspective, how we would build a, or suggest building a solution uh, to some of these problems. And, and this is sort of a, just a visual in terms of how a natural resources portfolio could look. So there's four ways that you can uh, match this supply demand issue. You can either increase supply, you can decrease demand, uh, you absolutely need to improve and assure quality, uh, as we've seen, uh, and I'll come to some examples. And then finally, uh, and per the previous slide, we absolutely need to build and repair infrastructure. So infrastructure has become a major, as I say, politicians finally getting it, industrialists finally getting it, and you're seeing, surprise, surprise, uh, a big green energy bill coming out of Europe in the last 12 months. Uh, one of the top uh, issues in the Biden presidency is clearly in, an infrastructure bill when it comes to green energy. We're seeing the same in Japan, in China, right across the world. So this is, is a terrific uh, vector, I suppose, from, from our perspective. And just to talk about a couple of the themes on this slide, I mean, I, I kind of break out those. You know, these are the solutions as such. Um, so people get it if you're going to have more water. Well, you can either desalinate or else reuse the water you have. Uh, if you are, if you're looking in, in the middle of, of uh, this slide in terms of smart grid and energy storage, um, improving quality, well, ask Texas right now, uh, they certainly would like to have a smarter grid. Uh, when it comes to power transmission uh, on the right hand side, ask California last year with the, with the, with the fires, uh, particularly on the, on the west coast of California, where they pretty much lost the entire power grid. If you want to talk about leak detection, just come to Dublin or any big city. 60% of our water is leaking today. So there is a major infrastructure issue uh, and already scarce resource uh, leaking through the ground. So this is where, you know, this is very tangible, understandable types of, uh, of, of um, solutions that we speak to. On professional farming, just to mention uh, the ag side a little bit, go to California. Uh, I'll show you uh, in a couple of minutes the impact side of, of professional farming, but this is all about uh, water scarcity um, and solving that, uh, better seed, seed applications uh, and better energy production on the farm. So from a, an investor's perspective, I think I just talk about three things that people look for. Uh, Firstly and foremost uh, is alpha. So there's no point in investing in this unless there is alpha. 
we absolutely, as I said, uh, believe there's mega, mega trends uh, and mega tailwinds here that will drive multiple decades of alpha. And that's already been the case in many, uh, in many cases from our perspective. The reason is better earnings growth potential and ultimately superior growth uh, uh, combined with attractive valuations. I think the other thing from a client perspective is diversification. Uh, you're getting very high active share versus broad market exposures. Um, a bit like the previous speaker, and in this case, you broadly have about a 1% overlap with the MSCI World uh, Equity Index. So this is truly different. And then finally, and very importantly, um, whether you believe in ESG, which thankfully most days, uh, most of our investors do, but some are deniers. Uh, if you are a denier, I say you're getting ESG and impact for free. If you're somebody who truly believes in this, it's absolutely embedded in these types of strategies, which I'll go on to speak about. So three components of what the what these strategies would bring from a client perspective. This is just a, a slide. I suppose it's a, a deeper dive into solutions uh, that might come to to, to just uh, you know building out a clean energy infrastructure or a climate change solution that that some some clients have asked to. And again, it's tangible. It shows you the kind of uh, the mega trends in the left hand column. It shows you the theme that you would be playing uh, and then some, just some examples of stocks that, that play into this theme. So as I said at the beginning, KBI were a specialist, long only equity boutique. So these are all listed equities, uh, daily priced. Um, but in terms of some of the, some of the, the trends uh, that are out there, we're just showing you in the clean energy space, which has clearly been a, a very uh, you know, strong area in the last couple of years. We could equally show you a similar chart in terms of water. The water industry is far less sexy, I suppose, than the energy industry. It's many of the companies on our water portfolios will be around for over 75 years, whereas clearly when it comes to clean energy, that may not necessarily be the case. The third point I spoke to was just responsible investing. Uh, I think it is important to show uh, what that means because it means different things to different individuals. Uh, from our perspective, it's a holistic uh, as, as on this slide here. Uh, it's ESG integrated at the six o'clock position right up through uh, active ownership, uh, which is important to clients. Um, so both voting engagement, all of those are expected by clients these days and something that we deliver in these and these types of natural resource strategies. And then as we go to the, the sort of two o'clock and four o'clock position on this slide, what's really grown in recent years has been clients saying, yeah, I get it. I want the alpha, I take that, but I also want to know what's the impact of these, of these strategies. So um, I, will, I will get onto that uh, more, more uh, specifically in a minute, but this is from our perspective, the, the sort of RI journey that you need to see uh, from, a, from a client perspective. I would say three, four years ago, when people asked about, give me an example of the impact of your portfolio, it was quite a qualitative discussion. Um, and, and it still is to a large extent, because we need to explain qualitatively what types of uh, you know, impact your portfolio is having, which just show on this slide for, for your uh, reading later on, sort of nine or 10 different uh, examples of impact from a thematic perspective. So I've already commented on precision in agriculture but that is having very strong impact when it comes to needs for say usage of fertilizer or water or crop chemicals, uh, very, very uh, um, efficient usage in those cases and so on and so forth. Clearly on the renewable energy side, again, you can, and we all see every day how much of our grid is being produced, uh, the energy is being produced from a, um, through the grid. Uh, and um, so, so that's the traditional uh, measurement of impact uh, from a qualitative perspective. At KBI, about uh, we're now into our fourth year of this, uh, we pioneered a quantitative assessment of impact as well, which many of our clients really like. And this is what we call our uh, revenue aligned SDG score, our RAS score, where basically we, we uh, measure the impact, uh, the, the revenue impact to the SDGs of our portfolios, both positive, negative and neutral. And basically from a client perspective, in this case, it's one of our strategies, we will be able to say to you that 74.7% .7 of the revenues of the underlying portfolios are positively aligned towards achieving the UN SDGs. Uh, and you can see uh, on, on the top of the page, what percentage is aligned to each of the SDGs. So clearly water is a, a reasonable component of this portfolio. 
So SDG 6, 16.5% uh, along to water. So that's, uh, that's about it, uh, Christopher, from my perspective, I think I just wanted to give you a, an introduction to, to, to natural resource investing with a difference. I wanted to tell you a little bit about who we are at KBI. Uh, and I think just from a client perspective, again, there is a, a, an investment case for natural resources that has three components of alpha, better diversification, uh, and also very strong uh, responsible investing characteristics. So I will leave it at that, uh, and hopefully Thank there's you, some questions. Carl, that, that was really interesting and thought-provoking, and at times really very concerning. Uh, the, the, the challenges facing policymakers around the world, of course, is enormous. One of the figures that struck me was the 1% or less than 1% of water globally that is available to use, and the 40% increase in use that's projected in a very short space of time. It's, one of those things, I think we fair to say we all take it for granted without a second's thought, but it's a, it's a big issue. Um, no, I'm going to leave it there because we are short on time, sadly, but there will be opportunity a bit later yep. for a question and answers. So we can come back to any, any issues we want to unpick there, but I'm going to leave it just for now. We've got a couple of, um, a couple of other questions that are coming from the audience. Uh, one for um, KBI Global in Investors and the question um, that we have here is how important is longevity and in an experience in ESG investing something that um, KBI have you know what difference does it make and we'll put that up to Noel please um, thanks Gary well well I suppose it's important from a number of perspective uh, firstly I think you're seeing from a marketing perspective, a big focus these days from, from fund buyers and everybody else on the question of longevity when it comes to the whole topic of greenwashing. Uh, and that, that question as to whether this is just a, a new rebranded marketing story or this is something you truly believe in and therefore it's in your DNA. So longevity, absolutely. If you have a team that's been doing it for, for over 20 years, I think that's, that's without dispute. I think the other thing from a, a bottom-up investment perspective is, is that longevity is important in terms of how you, you know, basically integrate ESG, what, how much you believe in it, how much is part of your decision-making, um, and how it's important with, for example, how you engage with companies or how you vote against companies or not. So, so that longevity and ability and track record to, to demonstrate that is absolutely important. Um, and it's not either or, I think is the final point I'd say. Uh, when people talk about ESG, it's almost like a separate decision uh, to, to us, KBI, it's not. Um, and you know, that's, it's, it's a bit like the previous discussion about balances out there. So it's a balance between the value put on ESG and the value you put on the fundamental, other fundamentals in a company. You can have companies with absolutely fantastic ESG and pretty horrible fundamentals that may not be investable. And equally, you could have a company with fantastic fundamentals and really, really poor ESG that in aggregate makes them fundamental, makes them uninvestable. So, so to us, I think that's where that experience, having a specialist dedicated team who sort of live, eat and sleep this stuff matters. Um, so, um, so longevity is, is uh, to, to answer a long question, is, is important. It, it also answers, thank, thanks Noel, it also answers one of the other questions um, in part about, about greenwashing. It's a term you hear a lot um, at the moment. How, how can investors combat this? How can those making those fund selections um, get past greenwashing? Yeah, it's a question we get a lot these days. Uh, and I think the best answer I've seen from anybody out there is, is you know, interview the CIO of, of the firm for five or 10 minutes. And, and if, if he or she really gives you a belief and a passion and a dedication to ESG, then you're pretty much uh, sure that that's the culture of that company. And if it comes from the top down, uh, then you can be pretty much sure it's, uh, it's, it's ingrained there. Uh, if it's uh, if that's not a very satisfactory discussion uh, and that CIO points you to the ESG team or the head of RI or the marketing team, then it probably answers it in a different way. Uh, so I think it's pretty, that, that's my best answer to that for anybody is just interview the CIO um, and, and uh, that, that will uh, 
hopefully give you a pretty strong view on that answer. 